Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Greetings, or may I say Bojo and Potawatomi, to those joining us for today's Indigenous Perspective show. I'm Randy Pitkowski, an enrolled Potawatomi tribal member and co-host of Indigenous Perspectives, along with Carolyn Schmidt. Today, we're in Montreal, the largest city in Quebec province of Canada, visiting the Roundhouse Café, or Café de la Maison Ronde. The place where we are right now is part of the traditional unceded lands of the Ganiyankaha Mohawk peoples, part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. There is also a strong historic presence of Anishinaabe peoples in what is now known as the Greater Montreal Area. Jaujakwe, its Mohawk name, Muniyang, its Anishinaabe name, or Montreal, has also long been and continues to be a gathering place for many First Nation peoples from all directions. The importance of a gathering place for diverse peoples is at the heart of the mission and activities of the Roundhouse Cafe. Since 2015, it's been the only cafe restaurant in Montreal dedicated to serving Indigenous food, and its focus is on providing a safe meeting place to serve Montrealers who are Indigenous, First Nations, or Inuit residents. So we're going to start off talking with one of the people working here, Trisha O'Mara. And Trisha, as the first question is, how did you find the Roundhouse Cafe? Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so I found I found the Roundhouse Cafe through Native Montreal. I had just come back from Ottawa, um, and I was looking for some work, and I was um, referred to work here by Native Montreal. And I did phase one for a few months when I was pregnant, and then I had my second baby, and now I'm doing uh, phase two, uh, which is a more like. Um, wider range program to help me get either back into the workforce or back into like the education system. Um, so basically I'm, I have a long lineage of um, enfranchised Indian from, uh, or in, indigenous persons from Saskatchewan. Um, my great grandmother married out of the culture and so she was like banished from her community and she moved here to Montreal. So we've been urban indigenous people for quite some time now. No, no. And so there, there are many different, really, varieties of indigenous urban people. Um, some of them have lived here for a very long time, actually, <laughs> since the very founding of Montreal. Others are people who have arrived recently, as in days and weeks, mm -hmm. from very, very far away. Where in that spectrum would you put yourself? Are you a very urbanized indigenous person or? I'd say I'm very urbanized, um, but I'm all often called back to going to nature, going to powwow, practicing um, indigenous culture. Um, I'm a dancer, I'm a jingle dress dancer. Um, I've been around elders. Uh, I've moved around. I've visited Ottawa for a few years. I was in university there. Um, trying to finish, been off for like two, three years now, so trying to get back into it. But yeah, I've been around, I think, the community, the urban community, it's really important for like someone like me that's been in the urban setting for so long. So, Carolyn did a nice job of talking about diverse people meeting here. How truly diverse do you experience this place being? Because we, we pass through on our bicycles and I've seen Inuit, I've met people who are Cree from 600 miles north. We're going to talk to someone who's Mohawk 
I, I I mean, the roundhouse is basically all the indigenous peoples in like one setting, I guess. Um, we're all from different backgrounds. We all kind of get along. And that's, I guess it's the urban community that we have here is being from Inuit, Métis, or like First Nations. Um, and then the other people we meet are non-Indigenous people. Some are, you know, um, traditional settlers. Some are immigrants. And that, that, makes, that makes like really nice conversations. You mentioned phase one, phase two of the program. Can you elaborate a bit on what that is? Um, so phase one would be like uh, for someone um, who's who probably just moved here. Um, it's a paid cash kind of thing. Um, you're on the call, so you're not always on the schedule. Um, it's really to help you come out of like um, like someone who's close to homelessness, I guess. It's like a little extra money for them. Um, if they're consistent uh, in their shift, they can move to phase two, which is a more elaborated program, more responsibilities. <laughs> so this takes place yeah. in the context of operating this, really it's a small, small yeah. business. Yeah. So just give us a little bit of detail on what you've done in phase one working here and what you're doing in phase two and well, what you hope to acquire. Yeah, so in phase one, I was pretty much just a barista here. Um, I learned the, like the cooking skill, the barista skill, a serving. Um, that's pretty much like phase one. And then phase two, we have like an office uh, space. So we do a couple of shifts at the cafe and then the rest of the time we're um, busy, I guess, uh, building ourselves, working on our resumes, reaching out to like where we want to be, our goals, our long-term goals, our short-term goals. Um, so that's pretty much what phase two would be about compared to phase one, which is just like going back into the workforce and, you know, respecting your ships and whatnot. I noticed obviously there's a lot of camaraderie and bonding and friendship among the people who work at the Roundhouse. Can you say something about the sense of shared being indigenous and how this can contribute to that? Um, well, there's an understanding when you're indigenous towards another indigenous person um, where we can like relate on a spiritual level or like traditional level or like our traditional sense of community of like sharing cultures. Um, it really makes me feel at home because due to like my family being here for so long, there's like a loss of commu community. Uh, between us and like our relatives in Saskatchewan, for example. So being here makes me feel at home where I can be indigenous without any shame. So you're encountering a lot of people who are also non-indigenous. And when you look through the window and I'm seeing people getting their you know, wonderful food orders right now, um, you know, there's in many ways an enormous boundary to cross, and you're talking about going out into the workforce. This is the 21st century. In theory, one would hope that there wouldn't be obstacles for an indigenous person entering the mainstream. How do you see that reality? Well, huh, there's a lot of stereotypes I feel are still stagnant uh, in today's world, even if we're in the 21st century or whatever. There's still a lot of, like, backlash or like prejudices towards our peoples like meaning that like we're lazy or what's or whatnot that's something you'd see like in the past but it's still predominant um in the like main society or the dominant society right? so like like me and again this is a radio broadcast not a television broadcast to someone on the street they wouldn't look at you or me and say oh that's an indigenous person so we, we can, as they used to say, we could pass as, you know, settler mainstream white people in the culture. But that's a, that's a barrier also, isn't yes. it? If you want to take a job and people ask you who you are, do you, do you feel obligated to hide your identity? Or um, now do you want to come forward with it? I more want to come forward because I want people to know that um, indigenous people, I'd say, come in all shapes of coffee. I mean, some of us are really pale like a latte. Some of us are dark rose. Some of us are caramel. Um, so, I mean, and that's through colonization, right? Like, there was so much intermixing at one point uh, with, like, some immigrants that came in the classic Irish, Scottish. Um, there were, like, the... Um, 
African Americans that also came and got mixed up a little bit with us. So like, yeah, I mean, today I'm just like, yes, I'm indigenous. I'm not Pocahontas. I'm not your stereotype. And this is who we are as a people. So accept me for who I am. Wonderfully explained. I loved your coffee metaphor. <laughs> Thank you. So we're, again, people won't know this or hearing it, but we're in a rather affluent part of Montreal. This is a business district, and it's only a few steps away from the, you know, incredibly affluent Anglo neighborhood. I'm assuming you must have some people who stumble up to the window not realizing where they are and who they're encountering. Um, do, do they ever have sort of aha moments that you can engage them in a kind of education, uh, opening their eyes? <laughs> Well, yeah, some people just come up to the window and they're just like, yeah, I'll have a coffee. And then they look at our menu and they're like, oh, it's an indigenous coffee. And I'm like, yeah, we're all indigenous here. Um, welcome. We are here. We're still present. Um, we're resilient. And I've heard someone tell me that um, this area here is for Shabbat or Shabbat um, has always been a place for indigenous gatherings, uh, protests. Um, so there's a lot of like energy here and a lot of people are drawn here of that. Yeah. Well, it's really ironic that the square is named after Cabot, who claimed this territory originally for the English. Even though he himself was Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's one of the, the, the founding displacer <laughs> people and, and, and here are the indigenous people, in a sense, taking it back. It's a, it's a wonderful, glorious story. I'm looking at his statue and laughing when I say it, but there are a lot of tears associated with that. Could you just say a little bit about the different strands of indigeneity in your own background and also your settler background as well? Because the whole point about indigenous perspectives is that the whole diversity that we're, we want to honor. So uh, my great grandfather was Irish immigrant uh, during the potato crisis, I heard. Uh, married a Plains Indian. So we're still trying to figure it out because I am. I was told that uh, we're like Dakota, Lakota, uh, but we may be a little bit Ojibwe as well, uh, depending on the location. Um, it's all about oral history at this point. Um, I am in the process of getting my S3 status, my identity, um, which is nice. It's only been uh, allowed since 2017, but a lot of research uh, to be done. Um, and it, it, it's nice to be able to be Indigenous outside of home because I grew up only being allowed to be Indigenous at home, and now I can be Indigenous outside of home. Take, take a moment to explain to us um, how this works in Canada, getting status. is a little different than the United States, where, for example, my tribe just looks at the enrollment as of a certain date, and they don't care about blood quantum. It's just, you know, what is your ancestor enrolled in? Has it been continual? How, how does it work here in Canada? Um, so here, uh, it's still very like, colonial, <laughs> from what I understand. Um, it's all done through uh, Indian Northern Affairs, so INAC. Um, and like depending on uh, the year, because there's different types of statuses, right? There's like the C31s, there's the C4s, there's uh, there's uh, S3, which is new, um, and then there's like the traditional status where um, it's from your band, your band, uh, you're born from your band, so you automa automatically have a uh, status versus someone like me, I have to do research, I have to find my um, community, um, which I'm still looking into. Um, yeah. So are there yeah. different levels of benefits for the different statuses? No, once you get your status, you have like the same as all the others. So ah. I would have fishing rights. Uh, would you have rights participating in scholarship programs? And, yes. Ah, yes. ah, this is a very different understanding yes. than I had. Yes. This is very helpful. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could still ask for a bursary, but then I also have to identify as being indigenous, like everywhere in my life, and sign documents that I identify. Versus, if I have a status, I just show my card. But then that's also very colonial because it's also very based with, like, um, the blood quantum. So they'll look at, like, how many ancestors you have that are indigenous, how many non-indigenous, and then the government chooses for you, not necessarily your band. Oh, interesting. So, like, I think you were saying that uh, your band chooses for you based on enrollment, right? Correct. Versus here, it's 
yeah. not necessarily the same. Yeah. That's a real difference, as I understand, between Canadian First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, Ancestry, or Metis, and United States, because in Canada, the federal government definition is the guiding one for everyone. In the United States, each individual band sets its own membership criteria. So a band can have U.S. federal recognition and have one set of criteria. Another band can have a completely different set of criteria for membership in that one. Um, so there are obviously, we had one, a Benaki Vermonter said that they were the only, that Indians were the only group that has to have a card <laughs> to prove, you know, a special card to prove what group they belong to. I guess that's true. In it's true Canada here as well. well, yeah. But more and more uh, younger Indigenous are not applying for status because it's a way to fight blood quantum, which was uh, put in place uh, by the government. And who is the government to say if I'm Indigenous or not? That should be my choice, and it should be the choice of me having my culture and my traditions that I still practice today. It's a very timely message for us. We're planning on having programs in the future on exactly that topic. In Vermont right now, we're having a, an enormous controversy that just erupted in recent weeks because, ironically, some Canadians came and said, our Abenaki aren't real Abenaki. So, you know, this, this, this is a, a huge issue, and it's growing, and the more intermarriage and, quote, dilution of the blood quantum, the more more our tribes risk disappearing from the face of the earth. I love, love your affirmation, but Thank it's, you. it's up to you. Well, to it's serve. still the goal of the government to make everyone diluted, I guess. <laughs> well, Tricia O'Mara, we really thank you for your insights and giving us much more of a sense of some of what being a person, an indigenous person in Montreal today is like. So are there any final comments that you'd like to leave us with? Um, I'd just like to say uh, for the interview and chimigwech to the community here and looking, looking forward to uh, just seeing what Montreal has to give again because I was gone for eight years and realizing there's a lot more Indigenous presence today than there was when I was a little girl. Great way to end and miigwech. Way high Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PotawatomiHeritage.com. Period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American Women's Nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society. Listen up. The source for information and inspirational items about the struggle and wisdom of indigenous people is the Syracuse Cultural Workers. They are committed to peace, sustainability, social justice, feminism, and multiculturalism, and they create beautiful visual materials like calendars, t-shirts, cards, and more, including their greetings and thanks to the natural world, according to poster that offers daily grounding for our relationship to the earth and its many fellow being. Get so many wonderful items. Go there now. SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com 
Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Feel you have no control over life? There's something you can do to make a difference for you, your family, and community. Stay positive and take a break from the dark side. Uplifting and enlightening. Listen to the positive side of podcasts. HRNradio.com Now we're talking with Shlee Benessi, another person, another participant working at the Roundhouse. So Shlee, can you tell us a bit about how you found this and take it from there? Hi, thank you. Um, so I guess for myself, I coming out of the pandemic or transitioning through the pandemic, sort of coming out of it uh, back in like December, it was very crisis time for everyone and I just got I feel like I just was sort of guided on my journey in my life to just find resources so like as an indigenous person I just was like googling you know keywords of like indigenous resources around Quebec specifically Montreal and uh, through native Montreal I found or I was offered uh, an experience through the Roundhouse program, um, which is, I believe, is it funded or implemented by It's Never, like another, a French community that's sort of like trying to bridge those gaps between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. So I feel like that's how that this opportunity came to me, was based on that, um, that general understanding of like, um, you know, based on like the climate crisis and everything that's going on in the world, like, I feel like people are aware of what's going on and they're just trying to do, everyone's doing the best they can to like help alleviate all the, the effects that have caused like indigenous people to struggles in the ways that they have, the way that we are and trying to repair that, you know? So, and I found roundhouse program and my, my feelings and my thoughts towards the program and everything that I've been like learning and experiencing through it. I'm, I'm really coming full circle, which is kind of, for me, it's kind of ironic because it's like, it actually feels like t- the perfect time for me to be in here. I'd like just turned 30. So and that's like a, a time in people's life where you're like, you're coming full circle because it's like, you have to get on your path and do your work. Right. I just know this is like historically this is a thing for people. So I'm like the round house, I'm like I'm coming full circle. Woo! I got through my twenties and like, you know, before our twenties, like we're teenagers and before that we're children. So it's like and in my in our indigenous way of life and our understandings, we have a medicine wheel. So I'm coming full circle on my medicine wheel through the roundhouse program. So I'm really honored that I get to be Save through that somehow. So nice. by coming full circle, do you mean reconnecting with parts of your indigenous identity that you grew up with and then somehow lost? Yeah, yeah, totally. So what what is? Can you tell us a little bit about your indigenous background? What do you want to know? What is it? My indigenous background, my identity, like my tribe or my clan system. Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, so my tribe is, I'm Ojibwe from central Canada, the prairies tribes. And, um, in terms of clan systems, which was something we used to have a long time ago, I was informed I'm from a clan of the birds. So I'm a bird clan and I govern spiritual understandings. That, that's my clan system. So how did you get from there to here? That's a 
I was actually indirectly redirected by, I would consider this individual sort of like a soulmate who had a connection to the work that Louis Riel did, which sort of like helped me towards healing my, my, myself and the work that I need to do for others for over time. So I actually, I'm over here because of Louis Riel. So, <laughs> and the work he did, my, I didn't know about Louis Riel or who he was until I was in my young adult years. So, yeah. Well, I saw you earlier interacting, being very friendly and welcoming to another young woman who clearly had come, you know, for some coffee and snacks. So I gather that an important part of your work is making other people who come here feel comfortable. Is that, is that correct? Being a big empath, uh, I think, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys kind of walked in that was emotional. So I feel like that makes sense for you to say that. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned Louis Riel. Can you tell listeners who aren't from Canada, you know, why this person matters in Canadian history? Louis Riel um, was an, Louis Riel is such an important figure in Canadian history um, due to the fact that um, he tried to stand up for things that were opposing government systems, which was very brave. I don't really understand the entire story, so I can't really comment entirely because I'm just, I've only started learning about this through my 20s, but, you know, feeling the spirit of that through um, someone I felt a strong connection with sort of helped me be brave enough to leave to come over here. So, like, and actually, if you guys... Um, if anyone knows of the Human Rights Museum in Manitoba, there's actually like a plaque in the museum of like historical figures throughout time, and they actually have uh, Louis Riel right on on the level there with Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. So that's how important Louis Riel was in history of people who were leaders, who were spiritual and connected and <clears throat> help, helpers to the world and society. And also in advocating for the rights of his own people, the indigenous people and the Metis people against the intrusions, the violence, the dispossession by the Canadian government. So that's why he's a strong resistance figure yes, as they, well. Yeah. So we need to take a break. We're back in just a minute. This is Indigenous Perspectives. We hire. Located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, citizen Potawatomi Nation is Potawatomi County's largest employer with a rich history and culture as a sovereign native nation. Learn more about CPN by visiting its website, which includes information on services for members, tribal enterprises, government and constitution, the newspaper, and much more. All at Potawatomi.org. That's P-O-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Since 1975, Inner Traditions has been publishing books for the healing and spiritual journey. Their mission is to rediscover, preserve, and protect these spiritual traditions of the world so that humanity will forever have the tools to create a better future that will celebrate and heal the earth. Inner Traditions books, card decks, and other products are available wherever books, ebooks, and audiobooks are sold. Or visit innertradition.com's online bookstore. And while you're there, sign up for their free newsletter to receive special offers. That's innertraditions.com. 
period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American Women's Nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society.org. Don't get angry. Anger is a negative emotion that suppresses your immune system that may cause health problems. Make a positive difference by working together to protect and support your family, friends, and community. Take a break from the dark side. Uplifting and enlightening. Listen to the positive side of podcasts. HRNRadio.com Welcome back to Indigenous Perspectives. We're at the Roundhouse Cafe in downtown Montreal, and now we're talking with Yohoha, Yohohio Karot, who is one of the participants in the programs there. So, welcome. So, we've been chatting in preparation here for this segment about your background, which is a really interesting story of it in and of itself. So, can you... Can you tell us a little bit about your indigenous background? And then we'll talk about how that plays out here at the Roundhouse. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, um, I'm full-blooded Cree from uh, Timmins, Ontario. However, I was adopted into Benawage when I was a uh, very young age. So uh, culturally, I grew up Mohawk. And language-wise, I everything is I'm all Mohawk. So that contributes to a kind of dual or divided identity, yes? Yes, very. See, like, uh, I meet up with Cree people, but they, they try to speak Cree to me, but I don't know it because all I know is Mohawk, but I was always two Mohawk for Crees and two Cree for Mohawks. So we're used to dealing with people um, who are partly mainstream settler white and partly Native American Indian First Nation, but you're the first person we've been able to talk to, actually, on, on air who comes from this kind of very complicated dual indigenous traditions. So what, what, what kinds of challenges did you have to deal with as a young person growing up with these? Fitting in. It's always been about, like, you know, like fitting in, <clears throat> trying to be part of something, but never really accepted into it. You know, like, I've done my pieces with the language, culture, tradition, ceremonies, practices, and everything, but I don't know, I've never really felt part of anything my whole life. So here, here we are in a park um, in downtown Montreal at the Roundhouse where people from all different kinds of traditions gather. How does it feel being in a diverse indigenous setting? More welcoming than ever. It's, you know, like, it's all diverse. Everybody's different and we're all the same, if that makes sense. So I don't know. I'm actually enjoying coming here. And, you know, no one judges me. You know, feel judgmental or any comments or anything like that. They all, it's always welcoming, saying hello with a smile on their face and... Honestly, that's really looking for in my whole life. That's a, that's a really wow. deeply moving and profound statement. Um, if, if I can get you to dig a little deeper, um, so how, how is this place cultivating an ethic of inclusion when indigenous cultures sometimes on the reserve don't succeed? What, what do you think is the success formula? What's, what's the lesson to take away from that? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I would be able to say so, you know what I mean? Like, kind of a difficult thing to really think of and go through at the moment, but I don't know, they're just welcoming. Like, the way they are and everything, they, they, they know of everything and, like, exclusion and stuff like that, but they do their very best to include you in everything. And it's awesome, you know? They, they, want, they want you to better yourself rather than push you away and, you know what I mean? Like, exclude you from everything. So, what, what, how do you relate to other indigenous people who pass through here? I understand you've been here for a few months. Um, do you relate to them as being from a particular tribe or as being more generally indigenous? I don't really see like I don't really see that. I just see people nowadays. They I've learned to push away all that 
and just you know see people as who they are whether it be i don't see color skin or anything i just see people as people good or bad they are who they are so you know that's something we could aspire to in <laughs> mainstream society <laughs> So a, a lot of non-indigenous people come here. This is a very affluent part of town, um, extremely affluent part of town. How, how do you think they see people here behind the window who are indigenous? Well, some looks they give, you can tell they see us as minorities and lessers. But honestly, like I said, I don't really mind what other people have to think about me or anything like that anymore. So. That you see a little bit, but I mean others. But like I mean, I ain't gonna say like in general. But I mean, everyone's pretty good. They all try to do it and everything that, so it's all right. So where where do you hope this experience will take you on your journey? Somewhere better. Maybe somewhere better in my life that actually be happy and maybe with a family one day. But everything in its time, you know, one step at a time. So will it will it help you with employment and being part of Montreal? Uh, yeah, actually, I was actually when I first started here, I was thinking of getting into journalism. However, I want to actually get into maybe culinary arts since here, you know, we're cooking and stuff like that. So I'm thinking of becoming a chef or something. So you mentioned employment, and then previously you mentioned family. That's really important, especially for someone like you. You were adopted, and you adopted into a tribe where you're not entirely made it at home. How, 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 how do you imagine that playing out? Do you have a dream for that? Well, I've wanted family my whole life, right? Like, rejected at birth, given to a family, and even with that, it was always like my expectations of me were always too high. It's something I can never really achieve because everything I've done, it was never exactly good enough, right? They've always expected more of me and they said, you can do better, you can do better. Graduated, did everything I could, did everything for them, and they said, you can do better. And so I actually wanted my own little family so I would do something, right? Like something that I could actually be happy with, and you know? So, yeah. So do you think you would want to live in an urban and environment that is broader minded like Montreal or do you dream of living in the countryside closer to nature? What what what, what image do you carry around? Uh, well I mean I've done both things. I've lived I lived in uh same place for a little bit. It was all farmlands as far as the I can see. It was in an urban setting, you know, but I mean living in a city has its benefits and all that, but I don't know, I'm more of a quiet type guy, you know big fields and stuff like that and trees and so when I do picture family I do picture like big yards and stuff like that you know what I mean the rug rats running around and stuff <laughs> yeah. well it, it, it's wonderful I mean it's it's actually sort of the we, we call it in the United States you know the American dream you know of you know, having your own little little place um I I, I, I I hope this works for you as well as it does for the other people we've talked to and as I've learned in my own life these journeys take us to places that we we just don't expect. They just they happen. They find you, um, and it sounds like this is the place where you might be found. I think so too. Thank you for telling us your story. Oh, no problem. Have to. So, so thank you very much. We'll take another break and see you in a bit. Wait, hi. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at potawatomiheritage.com. 
period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American Women's Nonprofit Quek Society cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit quecksociety.org. That's K-W-E-K society.org. Listen up. The source for information and inspirational items about the struggle and wisdom of indigenous people is the Syracuse Cultural Workers. They are committed to peace, sustainability, social justice, feminism, and multiculturalism, and they create beautiful visual materials like calendars, t-shirts, cards, and more, including their greetings and thanks to the natural world, according to poster that offers daily grounding for our relationship to the earth and its many fellow beings. Get so many wonderful items. Go there now. SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Where positive people and radio unite. HealthyLife.net Welcome back to Indigenous Perspectives. We're here in Montreal at the Roundhouse Cafe talking with another one of the Indigenous participants, Patrick Metallic. Welcome, Patrick. It's glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background. I'm a Native American. I grew up in this Dukes, Quebec. I'm Native American. I grew up in this Dukes, Quebec. I have, I'm from part of the Mi'kmaq tribe. So if you're Native American, how did you end up growing up in Quebec? I was born in Quebec, actually. And for me, being in Montreal, I basically came down to start a new life, pretty much. Back where I was staying, it pretty much had nothing. So I had to really go out there to experience more stuff. So how did you find the Roundhouse Cafe? I got it from the Native Montreal Center, Native Montreal Friendship Center. They told me about the, if they asked me if I wanted to look for work, so I, I took the first, I jumped at the first offer pretty much. So when was that? How long ago was that? That was back in, sometimes in November of 2021. Oh, so tell us what's happened. What have you been doing here? I basically, a lot of times we have a chance to, like, I prepare the food, I keep the, I prepare the food to keep the place clean and deal with customers a lot of times. It made me able to open up more to be, like, just having a chat with my coworkers it's I like it here. There is not it's not very demanding sometimes. So what kinds of things have you learned here? What's been the what's been the hardest kind of thing in your time learning here so far? The kind of hardest thing I learned was trying to deal with the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm trying my best to really get it's gone because I'm not very good at French, so it also helped me to like interact with French people because I the only language I really know is English and be able to like put bits and pieces here and just enjoy listening to them. It's kind of is a good thing actually. I'm still not good at the cash register, but I'm getting there. So for, for our listeners who aren't aware of it, you know, Montreal is the largest francophone city in the world outside of Paris, but we're in a part of the city where there are a lot of English-speaking people. Yes. 
Um, but you're, you're having to deal with the, the real challenge of being in Quebec, which is you really need to be bilingual to, to function, yes? You, you do, actually. So I, it's not a mandatory thing. It's you kind of just need to know the bits and pieces so to really get there. So are you picking up French as you go along, or is you just picking up French at the cash register? Picking up French as cash mostly, but sometimes I do like try to get myself out there more because at the cafe I had a chance to like. Before the cafe, I was like staying home all the time, but at the cafe, it like, gives me opportunity to like go out more, explore. And, yeah. and have you met other Micmacs in particular, or is this not a question you normally ask when you meet with other people here? I there's a few more Micmac people in here that work at the cafe. I do have the blast to talk to them, like different cultures because there is, uh, I think, an Ojibwe and a Malisi. And we talk about each culture is different. So it's just having a few chat about the, our heritage, what we learned, what we grew up to. So it's more in, in, innovative <laughs> to re really just to increase your knowledge. So what kinds of common experiences are you finding that you share? The common experience is basically the powwows. <laughs> it's pretty much the same. Some do it different, but other than that, it's the common experience I know. It's like the powwows, uh, the festivals, a uh, couple of rituals here and there. So do you participate in your own tribe's powwows and rituals, or do you participate in those of other tribes? I, if I can, I go to anyone I'm, uh, I'm able to. So I do go to people powwow, other people powwows. I go to like sweat lodges. I try my best to be more innovative of my culture. Mm -hmm. And I try my best to listen to other people's cultures. We might butt heads here and there, but that's the point of giving your opinions, I guess. What are some special things that you feel you bring as a Micmac when you're talking with the other people? What are your sort of things that mean the most to you? Only thing I can really say is experience. Like, I bring my experience to the table. They bring their experience to the table. So it's never uh, a one-way thing. It's like, I've been through it. I went, they went through theirs. I went through mine. I, this is what I've been told and grew up with. They, uh, and they bring up the things that they grew up with too. So it's best to like, all I can say is experience. <laughs> One of the themes that's coming out in talking to people who work here is that this is a really diverse environment and that you do find some common grounds. Do you, do, do you find that that is pulling you away from your native ancestral heritage or do you find that it is awakening an interest in those ancestral connections for you? It's kind of growing. To be honest, when the right conversation hits, you it gets to the point you think. And for the, my point of view, be able to have those conversations, be able to like be try to be open minded, it, it does help me. But it's not like an everyday thing. We talk about our native heritage. Sometimes we just talk about the weather or what's going on. So it's. Not a constant thing to be like talk about spiritualists and all that other stuff, but when it happens, it's in, intense pretty much. It's like it gets going, it gets people thinking, it gets people to be able to be like, oh yeah, okay. We've been told several times today that sometimes the conversation gets pretty heavy. Oh, it, it, oh. And other times it's light. I just want to say for anyone passing through this neighborhood, this is a very welcoming, very cheerful place. Oh, definitely. There's a lot of times we are just 
have them blast or listen to music when it's not busy. <laughs> but when it comes to innovation, I mean, not innovation. <laughs> For it being a conversation wise, sometimes, yes, it does go intense, and a lot of times we will scream at one another. But other than that, it's okay. okay. Here's what I found online. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PotawatomiHeritage.com. Period poverty. If you don't know what it is, you should because you can help. One in four American women struggle to purchase menstruation products this year, resulting in missed school and even loss of income. The Native American Women's Nonprofit, Quek Society, cares enough to give Native American students and communities their period products, and they do it across North America. Please help women with your time, donations, or supplies to maintain their dignity and celebrate their strength during moon time. Visit QuekSociety.org. That's K-W-E-K Society. Listen up. The source for information and inspirational items about the struggle and wisdom of indigenous people is the Syracuse Cultural Workers. They are committed to peace, sustainability, social justice, feminism, and multiculturalism, and they create beautiful visual materials like calendars, t-shirts, cards, and more, including their greetings and thanks to the natural world, according to poster that offers daily grounding for our relationship to the earth and its many fellow beings. Get so many wonderful items. Go there now. SyracuseCulturalWorkers.com Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Feel you have no control over life? There's something you can do to make a difference for you, your family, and community. Stay positive and take a break from the dark side. Uplifting and enlightening. Listen to the positive side of podcasts. HRNradio.com And now we're going to wrap it up for today with our final guest, Mary Lou Maisonneuve. She is the project director of the Café de la Maison Ronde, the Roundhouse Café, and she's running this whole program that you've just heard participants speaking about. So welcome, Mary Lou, and just say a few words about what you do here and why it what it means to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm the project manager from the, for the Roundhouse Cafe and program. Um, the Roundhouse Cafe is a really interesting project. It's unique, actually, uh, because we are a social economy cafe uh, for indigenous participants to work at and to beneficiate from uh, workshops and uh uh, outings that we do in the city, uh, we participate to the indigenous the activities of the indigenous community in Montreal. Um, and what I do basically is coordinate the team of intervention workers who are really on a day-to-day basis with those participants who run the the Roundhouse Cafe with them. And uh, I help feel like make everybody feel comfortable. Uh, that they, they're heard in the program, that they, they can learn uh, new things uh, uh, working at the Roundhouse Cafe. And also I, I do like the logistics and administrative uh, uh, side of the project. So uh, like uh, office stuff, but it has to be done, you know. 
and um, I really love this project because uh, myself, I'm Métis. Uh, I'm part French Canadian and also have uh, Anishinaabe ancestry. I don't identify as an indigenous person, but I really want to be like as a Métis people, a mixed ancestry pe person. I really want to like be an ally to indigenous people who face such great challenges. And uh, I really believe this program, this Roundhouse Cafe helps them. Miigwech. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thanks to the Roundhouse Cafe. Cabot Square today is humming with optimism and energy, gathering and support, a gathering and support place for a diverse urban population. The voices of the indigenous participants you've heard throughout this program were delivered just a few steps away from the statue of John Cabot. But now, in mid-afternoon, his tall statue no longer casts such a long and dark shadow. Bright sunshine and rays of hope are making him a bit less intimidating, a lot less statuesque. A part of the past, while the young descendants of the First Nations people are now creating new futures for themselves. So as we wrap up our program today, a heartfelt miigwech, thank you, to our guests from the Roundhouse Cafe. Participants Trisha O'Meara, Shlai Benesi, Yohahio Karat, and Patrick Metallic, and also project manager Mary Lou Maisonev. And miigwech, thank you to our listeners. I hope the broadcast has given you time and space to reconnect with your roots in Mother Earth. Before your busy day distracts you from this moment, I encourage you to take a few minutes to reach out and feel the presence of living flora, fauna, and perhaps even that of your ancestors. Allow yourself to touch their presence, capture that moment, and hold on to it. And if you will, write to me and let me know about your experience. I can be contacted through my website at www.randykwiatkowski.com, where you can also find transcripts and supplemental materials for all Indigenous Perspectives shows. Located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, citizen Potawatomi Nation is Potawatomi County's largest employer with a rich history and culture as a sovereign native nation. Learn more about CPN by visiting its website, which includes information on services for members, tribal enterprises, government and constitution, the newspaper, and much more. All at Potawatomi.org. That's P-O-T-A-W-A-T-O-M-I dot org. Randy Krakowski's book, Without Reservation, describes his spiritual awakening as a Native American. It's a powerful, life-changing story where Randy shares his journey into the realm of ancestral Native American connections and explores his encounters with Mother Earth. The book actually helps you how to reconnect with your ancestors to rekindle your access to ancestral wisdom and nature. Available in print, ebook, and audiobook format, Get Without Reservation by Randy Krakowski from all major booksellers. For more information, visit Randy Krakowski. Com. Citizen Potawatomi Nation's Cultural Heritage Center, located near Shawnee, Oklahoma, features 11 immersive galleries with digital and interactive exhibits. Visitors learn about the tribe's history from origin to modern days and gain an understanding of citizen Potawatomi oral traditions and lifeways. Admission is always free. Open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Visit the Cultural Heritage Center on the web at PottawatomieHeritage.com. Remember, help for a positive life. www.healthylife.net